Welcome to this second installment of Presidential Term Limits and Consolidation of Democracy. This is coming to you courtesy of Katiba Institute and Kituo Cha Katiba in Uganda. On behalf of my, uh, my panelists, I'm just about to also introduce to you, I bid you welcome and we shall be having also a handy opportunity for our participants to be asking questions much, much later in the course of the program. This is the second installment, as I've mentioned, and uh, today we'll be turning our focus on the role of civil society, media and religious organizations in ensuring respect for presidential term limits, the case of Uganda and Kenya. My name is Dibala Inea and I'll be your facilitator through the entire uh, virtual meeting today. Well, it is King Louis XVIII, just to remind you, who say that punctuality is a courtesy of the kings and also the gracious politeness of princesses. And for that, I want to just apologize a bit that we're sitting a bit late because uh, of technical challenges here and there, but that has been sorted. But we just want to get down to brass tacks right now and also introduce our panelists who they come across Kenya and Uganda. All the way from Uganda, I want to introduce Imam Idi Kasozi, who is a senior lecturer, Islamic University in Uganda. Also, we have Crispin Kaheru, still from Uganda, is election and governance expert and former national coordinator of the Citizen Coalition for Electoral Democracy in Uganda. We have Caroline Gaita here in Kenya, who is the executive director of um, Zalando Trust. Also, we have Suba Churchill, who is a presiding convener of Civil Society Reference Group. And also we have Victor Mwire, who is the head of Media Development and Strategy Media Council of Kenya. So on behalf of our panelists and our participants, again, a hearty welcome to you. I hope you will enjoy this particular session. Feel free and let's make it exciting and of course, engaging as well. And just a tender reminder at the tail end as well, we shall give you a handy opportunity, as I've mentioned before, to ask questions and of course to our panelists and that will be ably answered by our power panel. But for now, we just want to give a few moments to a panelist to, to give introductory remarks. And uh, we'll start with uh, them telling us about their thoughts on the topic, uh, previous successes and milestones ahead as well. And let's just cross over to Uganda. We, began, we begin with Imam Idi Kasozi, who's a senior lecturer, Islamic University in Uganda. Imam, over to you. Good morning. Good to see you. So, uh, let me just drop in. Crispin Kaheru, if you you also can hear us, just let's cross over to I you. Can I can't hear you. Hear what uh, Imam is saying, a bit of uh, a technical challenge uh, there, but I'll sort that out. But Crispin, you can hear me. Good morning to you. Your introductory I remarks. You. I can. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, for this session and uh, for putting this together. Um, my just uh, some very quick thoughts um, in terms of uh, the theme of the day. I think I should, uh, I would be right to begin by pointing out uh, some findings from a research that was done by a Ugandan civil society organization on the whole question of uh, political transition in Africa. Uh, that since 1990 to about 2013, the election loss rate for incumbent presidents remained at about 14%, meaning that mm -hmm. in every 100 opportunities, incumbent presidents, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, lost 14 times only. And that aside, the, the, there are five main methods through which African leaders have frequently exited from power. Uh, in order of frequency, uh, and uh, top of those is uh, military coups or violent uprisings. Uh, we also have assassinations, we have natural deaths, uh, uh, we have uh, voluntary forced resignations, and at uh, the lowest of the ladder is uh, the loss of uh, an election. So um, when you look at those five, uh, they basically tell you that the whole question of uh, political transition, the whole question of uh, you know, moving power from hand, one hand to another uh, peacefully, is not uh, something that uh, we have a very high appetite for uh, on the continent, uh, especially going uh, 
by uh, by 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 what uh, has uh, been documented and uh, what has been researched. Um, mm. Mr. Moderator, can I just do uh, share my thoughts as well, um, or is there another longer session to share my thoughts? Of course, uh, you will have a handy opportunity along the way. This is just introductory remarks. But uh, I don't know. I just allocated five minutes for you, so we are remaining with two. Uh, will you be able to just maybe consolidate that in two minutes? And then broadly, along the way, we shall be having that uh, opportunity for you to also share your thoughts. OK, fantastic. So um, I mean, for, for Uganda specifically, the conversation around uh, presidential term limits gained a lot of currency in uh, 1986 when Museveni at his third in ceremony actually noted that the problem of Africa in general want to overstay power <clears throat> uh, because we had come from a, a history of political turmoil, a history of 1979, and uh, he had bombed himself into, into power and uh, he had ultimately been bombed out of power. So the anxieties around the limitless rule uh, was thought to be addressed as a key priority area uh, by Museveni's government. So in uh, 1988, when uh, the Constitutional Review Commission in Uganda was set up, uh, yes. one of the key or uh, quite um, popular opinion from Ugandans was that we need to make a constitution and that constitution should be able to save us from a reoccurrence of uh, a limitless rule. So in 1995, we see a constitution that ultimately had two critical safeguards that at presidential level, a maximum of a two-term limit and an age cap of 75 years uh, for presidential candidates. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, as you might be aware, um, since uh, all the way uh, between 2005, 2005, the first safeguard on limitation of term limits was kicked out of uh, the constitution. Uh, later on in 2017, the safeguard on the age limit was also kicked out of the constitution. So presently, we have a limitless rule. And that is why we are going, we, actually Uganda has even stopped counting terms for President mm -hmm. Yoweri Museveni. And uh, in the next uh, few months, we'll be going for a general election and uh, President Museveni will still be on the ballot uh, now that uh, he is actually crossing the, 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 the line of 75 years and he's allowed to run, but also there are no term limitations. But in all this, civil society has been central in terms of uh, being uh, a, 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 a facilitator. The whole debate yeah. around the reinstatement of presidential term limits, it has been a conversation starter it has been a resource for legal and political challenge uh, yes. for the whole question, around the whole question of political transition and uh, mm -hmm. at the risk of actually being branded partisan. Right, so um, I, I think for now, I'll, I'll stop at that and then we'll yes, share yes, a few yes. more thoughts as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chris, been on that. Uh, and I think that is a rich theme of information, just hacking back into history again and giving us also the current state of play as far as Uganda is concerned with the presidential term limits. We know, yes, this has been a hot debate in Uganda. Uh, we've seen the news clips as well, also where the MPs are heavily engaged, or were heavily engaged also in parliament, uh, throwing, of course, uh, uh, chairs and uh, quite an acrimonious uh, you know, uh, scene that we saw there. So I know Ugandans are really impassioned about this, but we'll have opportunity along the way to just also pick your brains on that as well. Let me all cross over now to Imam, just to find out if uh, we can get also his sentiments as well. Imam, you can give us a bit of history as well. We've heard from Chris Swin, so it shouldn't be much different from what maybe you'll be telling us, but your perspective, especially where the religion really comes to play. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Good morning uh, again. It is a pleasure to be invited and to be engaged in this discussion, uh, which is trying to determine or to shape the future of East Africa and Uganda in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the leadership. Uh, uh, as probably my colleague has indicated, the history, uh, uh, term limits came into uh, sight depending on the history that Uganda had, ha had undergone, especially because of political trauma, turmoil, 
we had had some crisis here and there, and then internal strife that he resulted into uh, loss of uh, quite a number of people, more especially people who would have been very probably influential and resourceful to this country. Uh, people like Ben Chwanuka, people, uh, and uh, the Okoyas and the like, those people who are uh, murdered in cold blood. And up today, nobody can confirm that this one is the one who killed this. We all move around speculations, and therefore, I think the framers of the 1995 Ugandan constitution had that in mind, and therefore they said the best way to check power in this country was put term limits. In our history, religious leaders have been at the center of its politics ever since independence. And previously, before where we are today, most all political leaders almost used to frequent uh, the, the seats of our religious people to seek counsel, especially when, when there was any critical issue uh, or serious issue or problem. Uh, but he, today, things have changed. Our bosses, our leaders in the, in the church and the mosque, okay, are uh, instead being uh, summoned or invited every other day and you to go and uh, dine, yeah, yeah, wine and dine in the state house. And therefore, maybe some of them have lost uh, uh, the trend of standing up to speak against some sometimes obvious injustices uh, that occur to this country. Uh, therefore, the religious leaders, if you can recall, uh, they played that role. And when uh, the debate for lifting term limits came into, uh, there was a lot of critical debate, especially uh, from uh, the Christian church through UJCC. They even issued a, a, a stunning document against the lifting term limits. However, uh, it, it, it did not succeed. And uh, they had even set out to mobilize the masses over this issue so that uh, we appreciate. And they, most of they were focusing on what uh, we had gone through as a country. Uh, for example, uh, you remember Cardinal Wamala uh, is quoted to have said that the Catholic Church would continue opposing the lifting of the presidential term limits. And he was, he gave these views very, very clearly in around, I think, 2003 uh, in, in, in a special message that he gave uh, towards the, uh, towards the Easter festivals. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we cannot say that, but unfortunately, much as the religious people would want to be part of the process, they are hindered by the theory of those, of, of, of those the, the, the so-called modern, modern political scientists who think that uh, religion is a private matter, therefore, it must not uh, interfere with the politics, which is uh, a, a, a public matter. But uh, as we all know, religion is also part, is, 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 is purely a public matter, because uh, what you do privately, uh, you do it maybe alone, but religion is done in public and it addresses issues that uh, affect the people. Uh, therefore, uh, as probably we go on, you will realize that even up to now, but the trends are changing. We previously had strong people like Joseph, Bishop Joseph Chwanuka, the late Emmanuel Cardinal Wamala, uh, sorry, the late Cardinal Suga, uh, then people like the late Sheikh Kasi Murumba, who stood up to the occasion to say that what is happening in the political sphere is not right. But today, because of what I have stated, uh, you will realize that uh, the, the tones have tended to turn down, uh, just you. because in most cases, I want to say last, that the religious leaders have also sometimes become dependent on the head of state. Right, dependent on the head of state. And of course, we'll give you an opportunity as well along the way to just pick your brains uh, to get that rich repository of uh, knowledge as well as far as religious is concerned and the presidential talent limits and consolidating democracy as well. 
Let's cross over now to our country here in Kenya. And uh, I know also Caroline Gaita, who's the CEO and the executive director of Mzalendo Trust, has been eagerly waiting as well. Uh, Carol, good morning again and good to see you. Maybe just to have your introductory remarks as well and tell us the place of the public and uh, uh, civil society as far as you know, the presidential term limits and uh, consolidating uh, democracy is concerned in the country here in Kenya. Thank you, Dibal, and it's really my pleasure to be here and thank you, Katiba, for putting this um, conversation together. I think in my view that you asked at the beginning uh, that we talk about the timeliness of the conversation and I think it couldn't be more timely. If you look at the last two decades in the advent of multi-party democracy, extension of term limits has actually emerged as the biggest threat to multi-party democracy. So if you look at countries that have been there, you know, Rwanda, Burundi, um, Uganda, where presidents have extended their term limits and therefore um, impacting negatively the whole conversation around democracy. Um, again, if you look at Kenya, uh, for example, our transitions, if you look at the last four transitions we've had, the first one was caused uh, through death in 1978. The second one was through the, uh, the end of the, the two terms for President Moy that gave, gave way to the first time that we had a leader from the opposition winning the elections in 2002, and that was President Kibaki. His two terms also ended in 2013 under a new constitu constitutional dispensation that had very um, clear provisions on term limits, Article, I think it's Article 145 on, on the term limits. Having said that, I think then if you look back, you realize that it is actually true that incumbents don't lose. So in Kenya, we've not had an incumbent president lose an election. Um, president Moi's two terms, he never lost. President Kibaki's two terms, he didn't lose. And the current president, Kenyatta, also didn't lose in 2013. Um, so uh, having, having, having said that, I think the conversation then becomes timely because the current talk about constitutional reforms is giving rise to, you know, to concern around the next transition that is expected in 2022. And so we are currently speaking about BBI and in the recent past, we've seen media reports about one, either the inclusion of transitional clauses that would lead to the extension of the current term for both the president and members of parliament and in other cases, we've also seen proposals about either, you know, um, the office of a prime minister or um, an, an, an area where we would be going the, you know, the Russian way where the president then takes on, stays on as the prime minister and vice versa. So in a nutshell, transitions in Africa are not easy and they're not straightforward. Um, the, the, my colleague from Uganda has shared statistics from Africa where only 14 per incumbents, 14% 14 of incumbents have lost office. And I think the, the efforts and the push to always stay in power at whatever cost, whether it is through constitutional reforms, whether it is through choice of um, successors, um, and whether it is through the the military coups as is mentioned, is then very strong. And that's where then the role of civil society organization comes in. Because if you look at the whole conversation around term limits, which was born around the same time also as the country gave, the country gave birth to multi-parties in 1991, 92, civil society organization played a very key role. And in talking about civil society organizations, in this case, I'm talking about the church, the academia, I'm talking about the media you know, that pushed, that organized, that, uh, that organized, that spoke to different actors, that brought together the different actors, organized mass protests, informed, created awareness materials. And so in a nutshell, civil organizations then, just like now, played a very key role in ensuring that, uh, in ensuring that term, term limits were established as a norm in the country's gov governance structure. We all recall, uh, you know, the bishops, we all recall the organization such as the NEC that brought together the different opposition uh, parties together. 
we all remember the bishops using the from the pulpits to the parks you know talking about the need for constitutional reforms for multipartisan and for mm -hmm. an end to term limits and so just like then um civil society organizations have a key role to play in sensitizing uh, the public in ensuring that constitutional requirements are uh, are followed and ensuring that abuse of power um, does it does is not entrenched by whatever mm. uh, by whatever means that those in power may attempt to use Guys, I thank you for your sentiments as well. And I think in the same breath, I can invite uh, Suba Chachil as well, who is in that space, uh, to tell us more about the civil society and to chime in on what also Caroline uh, is telling us this morning. Suba, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Dibal. Uh, it's, a, it's a long time, but it is good that we're still able to meet. I think um, picking up from where Gaita has left, um, I think the history of term limits for Kenya is, is as recent as uh, 1992. We all remember that um, um, the first two presidents, um, uh, Jomo Kenyatta and uh, successor, the late President Moi, uh, Daniel Arap Moi, uh, never used to get quite elected through the popular vote. And, and so we had this uh, mixed blend of of, of what started as parliamentary, but increasingly became presidential, but without removing um, the elements of parliamentary system that, that made them serve for, for years on end um, without uh, any recourse to the people. Uh, and so Kenya's uh, term limits um, can be traced to as recent as 92, but even when it was introduced, um, you know, there is this um, non-retroactive application of the law. Um, and, and so President uh, Moy said, you know, this law has just come into force and it does not take into account in the, uh, the, the, the more than a decade that he had already been in office. So he was starting afresh. And so when he served his uh, two terms, um, I remember, you know, getting uh, an, an, an idea about discussions that were ongoing. Um, there was even an attempt to uh, stay on, uh, succeed himself. Uh, and so in Kenya, we say that um, even though we have respected to date um, the issue of term limit for president, um, I do not think we are out of the woods yet because as the Swahili saying goes, um, looking at what is happening in neighboring Uganda, uh, in neighboring Rwanda, Burundi, uh, the Swahili say that ukiona mwenzako ananyolewa, utie chako maji. Kwa hivyo, we are not really safe because when we see um, the, how the authorities in Uganda and, 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 and neighboring Rwanda and Burundi are manipulating uh, public uh, opinion to, yes. to suggest that um, the leaders have to continue ruling because they are the most popular. Uh, then all this, you know, serve to whet the appetite of our, even our own. And, and, mm -hmm. and people tend to say that if it has happened elsewhere, why not here? Mm -hmm. And so increasingly, as uh, Caroline Gaita has pointed out, we have had sentiments expressed in this country to the effect that um, President Uru Kenyatta would be too young um, to go anywhere after finishing his second term in 2022. And of course, those who are saying this uh, are definitely privy to conversations that perhaps happen in, the, in what is called the deep state. And so we do not get to, um, um, to know within what context they are saying this. And, and mm -hmm. when they are saying President Uru Kenyatta is too young, uh, are they suggesting that he can continue serving as president or any other capacity? Of course, we have in Africa cases where former presidents have become mayors, you know that. Uh, but I don't think that um, our president, Uru Kenyatta, is so humble as to come back to want to serve. Thank you. As, uh, as deputy governor or as member of the National Assembly. Um, he's a man who was born into royalty. Uh, he right, grew thank up. You of state house and and so we would be surprised if if 
Yes, Dibal, you're yeah. saying something. Yeah, I'm sorry to bite in. I think your five minutes are over. So I know I'll give you also opportunity to, you know, continue with your thoughts on that as well and plumb deeper about the youth uh, or the youthful, uh, you know, state of some of the presidents. That This has been a notion that has been also gaining traction around Africa that as far as we are concerned, if you're young, then we can actually, you know, breach that particular presidential term limit and uh, extend also your tenure as well. That is something that we're going to broach along the way. But allow me also to get the space of media in this, uh, which is pivotal as well. And uh, Victor Buire is on the line as well. Victor, good to see you after a long while. Thank you, Debal. Uh, the debate is, is interesting in the sense, but to look at uh, the role of media in presidential term limits is contextualize and say what has been the, uh, the media's role in, 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 in Kenya's uh, fight for independence, uh, I mean, Kenya's fight for, for, for opening up the, the, the democratic space, Kenya's uh, media's role in, 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 the, in the current, the, in, in the new constitution. And, and you can say, and start seeing that yes, media has been very present and, and very present in the sense that if you look at the first, uh, the, the fight for independence, you see a number of publications, media, journalists, media writers that have that, that played a big role in, in, in the fight for independence. And for that, then, then you start looking for, for clamor for multi-party, again, up to 1992, you start finding, and, and the Kenyan media history is closely tied to a political history that you start seeing uh, before 1992, you see Kenya had one media, for especially broadcast. You see KBC and to some little extent KTN because of its ownership. So it's up uh, until up to the IPPG and the repeal of Section 2A of the Constitution that we see the liberalization of the airwaves. So, so you, you, you start noticing that even the history of VOK, Voice of Kenya, look at it, the, the history of the standard newspaper in, in 1900, uh, is closely tied. And when nation comes, uh, standard becomes the opposition paper and, and, and it has retained the same. So, so you start seeing, then you start seeing individual journalists, individual media houses that have done a great service to this country in terms of pushing for uh, uh, the respect for constitutionalism and the issue of the, uh, the democratization process. See, uh, I mean, publications like the Society, Finance, Weekly Review, and a number of uh, host of journalists like, uh, I mean, journalists, media, uh, people like, uh, I mean, Philip Ocheng, look at uh, Gitobu Imanyara, look at uh, Gatabaki, uh, I mean, uh, Dindo, Agedis, and, and uh, Macharia Gaidos, and, uh, they have been, uh, Macalis have been very consistent in the manner in which they have pushed for the respect of rule of law, democratization, and respect for constitutionalism. So that's the bigger role that media has been very present in terms of agenda setting. Uh, if you looked at 2010, just before 2010, the media had already made up its mind that they needed to support the clamor for new constitution. And you can see it a uh, big time. Look at 1992 when Moy was trying to change the constitution to to change the term limits uh, by way of interpreting the new provisions under IPPG. So media raising this, uh, these matters quite uh, in a big time. If you see like the, the, the guy who was mentioning that uh, the, the, president, the president is too young uh, to, to go home, you saw the kind of articles and the kind of, I mean, including yourself, you hosted the people at NTV to start looking at that. Is, does, this, is this, does this resonate with our constitutional expectation and provision? Does this resonate with, with the, the rule of law and what we and the democratization? So media has been, and, and going forward, again, you start seeing uh, that, that even when, when, like the last two weeks when we were, when we were uh, marking the 10 years of the new constitution, look at a number of uh, the, the debates, uh, publications, articles, uh, viewers that, that journalists were hosting in terms of just analyzing how far are we, at, at the, the current constitution, how far have we implemented it? What is missing? Do we need a new constitution? Do we need a new reforms of this? These are very current debates that are there in the media, uh, journalists being there to uh, set the agenda, to watch dog what is happening, to, to, to act as, as gatekeepers in all this manner. And I'm sure they will continue uh, doing this uh, because of their public duty, because of, of just maintaining to ensure. But the bigger thing is, are we in, within all this debate respecting the rule of law? Do we respect constitutionalism? Do, do we respect our democratization space? So that whatever we are doing, even within the term limit debates, 
does it conform to what our constitution requires? Does it form to the, our democratic uh, democratization trajectory? And, and, and media would have failed if they don't uh, uh, focus on that and look at the demerits. And obviously quoting even uh, international, in addition to our constitution, uh, look at AU. Uh, AU has a big, big convention on term limits. Look at the, the, the Niame convention on term limits. Already those are there. So we need our journalists to bring this home to contextually that should any person entertain such a, a discussion or thinking about extending the term limits, then we are flouting our own constitution, regional convention that we are party to, and international conventions that we are party to. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, hearing from all of you, uh, it's a, a well-established fact that the abrogation of presidential term limits, you know, it go, goes full, full steam ahead to undermine accountability also increases concentration of power in the hands of one or a few individuals and shrinks the political space as well. And we know this ultimately uh, will lead to rising risks of political tensions, violence, and civil strife. That's why this particular conversation is very pivotal and providential to have it right now, even as most of our countries are also uh, getting towards general election as well. So I want just to put this host into a full run, we plumb deeper into a conversation as well. And uh, I'll hack back to Crispy and just give you also a chronology of what the civil society they've been going through in Uganda, just to read out some of them and, and maybe it, this will be intimately familiar with you. Uh, we have August the 3rd, um, activists organized, not this year, but activists organized under the Togikato campaign after the ruling political party introduced the age limit bill to parliament. And we know shortly after, politicians also spoke out against the unconstitutionality of the bill. We have also October 13th, 2017, the Ugandan government froze the financial accounts of Action Aid Uganda, a very vocal opponent of age limit bill, and accused the civil society organization of conducting illegal activities. Uh, we have also the Minister of Internal Affairs demanding that 27 Ugandan uh, civil societies submit financial, quote unquote, information to the NGO Bureau within seven days. Again, uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of Uganda froze the financial accounts of Action Aid Uganda, as I mentioned, uh, that particular organization before, and accused the organization of conspiracy to commit a felony and money laundering. Also, authorities banned all demonstrations against edge limits. Uh, used for or, and used force against demonstrators and also killed one protester. And I think this also resonates with our country as well because the civil society has also been subjected to some of these uh, uh, draconian you know, actions from government as well. But Crispin, from your point of view, do you think the, that political space for the civil society is being snapped out and you're overwhelmed because if, of course, we have all this financial information being demanded by the NGO, and then you told, oh, you're involved in money laundering. There's no way you can operate. So in a way, there's this strangulation that is coming from government. What is the current state of play? Crispin? Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, one, I think, uh, again, we go back to the history, that um, uh, 20 years into President Museveni's rule, uh, the whole concept of, uh, that he had talked about of uh, limitations on power completely lost uh, meaning then. And uh, I think at that point, it was when the, the, the presidential term limits were kicked out of the constitution uh, on uh, 25th September 2005. And that was just about five months to the 2006 elections. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if, uh, if uh, this change had not been made to the Constitution, President Museveni would not have been on the ballot for a third term, which was later renamed to a third term. Uh, so basically, I mean, even though um, Parliament passed that amendment, it was quite unpopular. Uh, uh, and from across uh, the political divide, we had uh, some movement of uh, NRM uh, MPs. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, together with the uh, civil society, um, together with the development partners, they were very vocal against uh, the whole idea of removing term limits from the constitution. And uh, that is uh, also not forgetting the fact that uh, the members of parliament were actually bribed with uh, about $1,300 
uh, paid to each member of parliament to vote in favor of the removal of the term limit. Um, but that said, I think uh, one of the central things that I see that is a red thread throughout the whole conversation of uh, you know, reinstating the presidential term limits is uh, the role of civil society. I mean, as soon as uh, the term limits were lifted from the constitution, uh, civil society together with uh, um, uh, a number of other lawmakers uh, ran to the constitutional court to declare the removal of presidential term limits in 2005 as, uh, as null and void. Uh, and um, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, this, although the, this petition was uh, uh, filed into the constitutional court, it was never given priority until I think about 13 years later in uh, 20, 2018. Uh, the other thing I, I wish to also point out is uh, um, just four years after the removal of, uh, of uh, the term limits, the civil society also came together to form a loose coalition to, pull, to push for electoral and uh, political reforms. Um, and uh, here the approach was really engage government through boardroom meetings, which later on did not really deliver much. Uh, and uh, that strategy was quickly rethought to uh, a, pu a more public, a more engaging strategy. So um, a few years later in 2011, um, uh, civil society resolved that uh, I think there should be a, uh, we should do a dipstick uh, check to see what is the public sentiment about this uh, 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 term limit. Uh, we could be sitting in the boardrooms and talking about term limits when the public is actually thinking something different. So 2011, the, the poll that was conducted by the Afrobarometer, and uh, it showed that 68% of the Ugandan population was strongly in favor of the return of the presidential campaigns. So these research findings were later used to launch a citizen's action for the restoration of presidential term limits in 2012. And this, as I've already observed, it was a total departure from the earlier boardroom approach. Uh, this was about mobilizing citizens and the general public to voice their conviction to their members of parliament to return the term limits uh, with anticipation that MPs would then uh, put it top on the legislative agenda. I mean, it was literally an all out war. It integrated town hall meetings, peaceful protests against the limitless status quo, media engagements. And of course, uh, there was uh, the unwelcome unintended cut fights between police and uh, the activists, both political party activists and uh, civil society activists. And ultimately, um, in 2013, civil society made the campaign a lot broader to cover the succession and political transition issues in Uganda. So at this point, civil society was the nucleus. Uh, it built alliances with uh, political parties, including, by the way, the National Resistance Movement members from the NRM, uh, religious and cultural institutions also joined into the fray just to give this you know, a much broader look but also uh, very mindful that uh, the executive or the head of the executive, uh, President Museveni, is very mindful of uh, public opinion. So, um, in fact, all the political party manifestos ahead of 2016 uh, committed to the implementation of uh, the political and constitutional reforms with the restoration of term limits being top on their agenda. But uh, <laughs> like uh, Saddam Hussein once said, politics is when you say, you're going to do one thing while intending to do another. Uh, the NRM, which won the 2016 elections, undoubtedly, uh, yes. um, did exactly the opposite. Uh, after succeeding itself, it embarked on a campaign to remove the last impending obstruction to President Museveni's life rule, which was mm -hmm. uh, the age limit for presidential candidates, uh, which had been constitutionally capped at 75 years. So this was removed in uh, 2017, and uh, that's the melee that you were talking about. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, that you saw in uh, in Parliament. I mean, it was uh, pa it was scrapped amidst a lot of resistance, public resistance, even from within. But I need to point out that civil society was very central uh, in all the efforts around resisting the removal of the age limit and trying to call for uh, the reinstatement of term limits, from carrying out surveys to filing petitions to organizing peaceful demonstrations. But most Thank remarkable. You. Uh, I think uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was also noticed that maybe we probably want to, to see a more embracing approach. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, the whole conversation around a national dialogue process in Uganda. And uh, I mean, 
but you know, the, although the civil society had vouched for a national dialogue prior to the whole conversation around the uh, removal of the age limit, the removal of the age limit just sort of disappointed all efforts in that regard. Said, okay, if on one side, I mean, we're talking one thing, uh, and on the other, that doesn't seem to be a commitment, then why yeah. do we need to engage in a national dialogue process? So that has basically been the, 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 the role of civil society. Uh, but what I can uh, conclude with uh, very quickly is that uh, I think the civil society has to invest more in building stronger circles of trust that include, that go beyond civil society and political parties to include the public, to include the key state institutions. And this is with hindsight that uh, the executive that we, the, the formation of the executive that we're looking at right now is very, very sensitive to public opinion. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Crispin, there. Uh, and of course, we'll circle back to some of the issues also you've raised as well. But uh, allow me to rope in uh, Imam uh, Edi here and just to ask you about a growing perception uh, from the pundits that the constitutional discourse no longer has a religious basis. Now, we know that uh, religion uh, gave state authorities and state power its legitimacy, and the government was the protector of, of faith at some point, if we may look at, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries, the European countries as well. Nowadays, they say religion is no longer that fundamental. The starting point are, or the starting points are democracy and the rule of law. Your thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I think it would be sad for anybody to think that religion has no place or space in a political development within any state. Uh, the problem is uh, our failure to understand the purpose of religion. The purpose, what should be the purpose of religion? The purpose of religion is to respond to public issues that emerge and people cannot have a quicker solution over them. And uh, even those who say so, when they have political issues and they continue, for example, from different political players, you see them ending up trying to include some religious organizations to help them talk to the people because uh, religion is built on values. You see, it is built on, 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 on values. The only difference is that because we profess different religious, uh, uh, religious uh, uh, faith, then sometimes people look at it as, 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 as a contradiction. But if you sat down and critically looked at the religious books, whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Quran, whether it is the, 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 the Zabur, uh, you will realize that there is something in common. And the purpose of the messages of, of these religious books is to harmonize humanity, to put a, a, a yardstick in which people uh, should live harmoniously by appreciating that every human life matters. Unfortunately, we don't, uh, but where does it come from what you have stated? It comes from, uh, I think, in the, in the, in, 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 about the, I think the, the, the 14th century or so, uh, when people struggled to divorce uh, religion from state. And they wanted, they want to make that clear uh, divide where they thought that uh, they actually, they concluded that religion was just a private matter and politics was a public matter. And therefore there was no need for religious uh, religion to play part. But you are aware, as I am aware, that uh, in many traditions, in many countries, including the United States of America, religious people played a key role in bringing the liberation of the so, or whether the so-called liberation of the United States today, eh? people like the, the, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and the team. If you come to your own country, Kenya, okay, you know what the church did to prepare Moi to, uh, to, to accept the changes that occurred, especially around 1992-93. If you can recall those issues or events of the Kamukunja events and the like. Uh, and equally here in Uganda where I am, you will know that all, including the time when President Seven was planning to go the bush, 
he had to consult, or he consulted with the previously, the religious leaders that were there then, and notable among them is Cardinal Suga, and his statements that he made. Uh, then uh, he consulted uh, the, the late Prince Ban Bukakungru, uh, who was for the Muslim community, and somehow uh, some other people got involved. But uh, what do we know? I think the problem why we are trying to restrict the religion or uh, religious people to participate in uh, it's more selfish than anything else because uh, when when we reach uh, when we assume power we go, we want them to come and pray when there is a problem we want them to come and pray if it was private then we should have left it to individuals to pray from where they are rather than gathering the people together to say so but in our case uh, you know I know for example. Uh, the religious people in Uganda strongly believed that, especially uh, Cardinal Amala, for example, during uh, the lifting of the term limits, he said that uh, if we do, if we do uh, that, we, it means we are trying to stiff for leadership, and in the process we shall breed the dictators, whereby uh, political space will be limited. Okay, and indeed. Uh, whether we whether we accept it or deny it, in Uganda, you. much as the elections, political space thank is you. limited. Thank you, thank you, okay. thank you, Imam Idi. Uh, I think we shall continue also with your sentiments on that and ask you also. Uh, I know way back in 2011, you contested if at all you were given that uh, opportunity to the president of Uganda. Would you? Uh, at the same time upheld you know the presidential term limits as well or you'll have taken the way many of the african uh, state leaders are doing currently to try and uh, breach this particular uh, term limit but allow me to just also uh, drop in caroline on this you've had the sentiments from uh, imam there and chris Spin in uganda it is not diametrically different uh, what has happened in our country especially with the civil society as well. We know the, uh, of the public benefits uh, organization as well, that uh, the PBO uh, bill that went full steam ahead, now it's an act, and many of you are adversely affected by this. Maybe you can tell us, do you think that particular space is being strangulated? The same question. And right now, would you characterize the civil society organization as, as, they, as, they, as they are right now, that vocal and strong, or they've lost their tender? Thanks. Um, thanks, Bibao. Um, so maybe we start by going back. And if you look at the challenges that faced the country in the 90s, and I, I did indicate earlier that, yes, the civil society organizations played a very key role in ensuring that the clamor for multipartism was met. Um, uh, uh, and then in 2002, of course, there was a transition to the to President Kibaki's government and a lot of uh, things that people are clamoring for, a new constitution, um, an opposition in government, some of those were then met between 2002. Mm -hmm. But of course, there were a lot of disappointments along the way. Mm -hmm. To the question that you're currently asking, um, in 2013, of course, just before the pre President Kibaki's term, the, the, the PBO Act was passed. And there was a lot of hope from civil society organizations that this, this would really cure a lot of the challenges that were facing the, the sector. Unfortunately, um, seven, eight years, seven, seven years later, the act has not been operationalized. So the challenges that were facing the sector still remain. And in the recent past, especially in the last two, three years, you've seen a lot of those challenges that existed in the 90s starting to creep back you're seeing a shrinking civic space, you know, where arbitrary arrest of civil society actors is happening. You've seen cases where um, stories, you know, um, media coverage stories either being retracted or bloggers being arrested for things that they have written. And of course, including the legislative framework being tightened to ensure that the, the, the freedom of, uh, the, the, the freedom not really curtailing the freedom of media, but there's, there's a, some sort of systematic increase, systemic increase um, in how the, the, the civic space is shrinking. To the question whether the civil society uh, organizations are still as vocal, I think that's not, 
it, it requires us to put everything into context. And if you ask me, civil society organizations are still vocal, but maybe in a different environment. So in the 90s, for example, we didn't have the social media, all right? And we didn't have the sort of um, media space that we currently have. And so much of what you would describe as vocal was being in the streets, was, dem was mass protests, was demonstrations, characterized by arbitrarily arrest them. But civil society organizations even now remain vocal, maybe using different platforms. A lot of the things that we have seen, demands for accountability, for example, demands for human rights are still coming from the same um, civil society organizations. In a lot of cases, the same actors that raised demands then and are still raising those demands, in, but albeit in a different environment. Um, in terms of the challenges now, in, in terms of the context of the term limits, I think the civil society organizations are still playing a key role in ensuring that the constitutional gains that we made since 2010 are not eroded. As the country celebrated 10 years of the, since the promulgation of the constitution last week, you saw a lot of organizing, a lot of formations around the issue of the constitutional gains and why it is so important to protect the, the, uh, those gains. One of them, of course, being the term limits, but two, also around the, the current constitutional reforms, uh, where we are now not directly talking about extension of term limits, but using another fancy language to create something that looks like an extension, but is not being called an extension. So the voice of civil society organizations remains strong, but the challenges that they faced then um, still exist, and maybe more so because now, in addition to um, you know the shrinking space, you're also seeing an environment where funding is not the funding environment is not the same as it was then. You know, countries that were initially very supportive of constitutional reforms have also adopted other priority areas. You know, trade and um, uh, you know, trade and and therefore that 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 sort of funding space for 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 governance work seems to have also shrunk. Um, another thing that I would say that could give rise to the element of civil society organizations being perceived as, as not being so powerful, while in reality they are, is maybe there's also a sense of citizen apathy citizen apathy, you know, in the, in the sense that when you've yearned and clamored for something for so long and for so much and paid a very high cost, and then you see those gains being eroded, I think there's an element of um, citizens kind of um, resigning to the status quo and, 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 and thinking that, um, you know, maybe the, the situation does not change and therefore you don't get the kind of support that probably um, met civil society organizing then. And then finally, I think we need to look at it within the broader context also of our political environment. If you look at the past, um, if you look at the past and uh, including civil society of the 1990s and even the civil society organizations within the early 2000s, there, there was a lot of uh, coalition and alliance building also within um, opposition, you know, opposition parties, you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. achievements that the country has made in terms of constitutional reforms were made on the backdrop of where civil society organizations, faith-based organizations, media organizations, and political parties, especially those in the organization, in, in the opposition, you remember the Safina party, the Ford party, LDP, came together and jointly called for constitutional reforms. Now, um, the operating environment currently is, is, is not the same. The, the, the voices within the opposition, the, what you'd call the opposition are not so loud. And therefore maybe in that context, you could then say that the voices from civil society organizations are also not so loud. But I think in terms of the commitment to the commitments to, to ensuring that constitutionalism and the adherence to the rule of law, including term limits from civil society organizations, remains very grounded and very firm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Caroline. 
And in the, in, in the same breath also, I should uh, rope you in, Suba, on this. When Caroline is talking about citizen apathy, and we know the civil society should be the intervening voice, do you think maybe we've had most of the politicians in our faces and we do not really have that vocal voice of a civil society? Then we resign as citizens and say, okay, let it be. Whatever that we, is being crammed down our thoughts, let it go down, briefly. Okay, okay. Uh, one may say that um, there is citizen apathy. Um, of course, that could be true. Uh, but I also see a sense in which um, um, the Kenyan civil society could also be described as a victim of its own achievements. Um, that when the civil society uh, joined forces with political actors um, to remove Kanu from power, and, and you all know how Kanu had been entrenched um, for, for God knows when, you know, from when Kenya attained independence from British colonial occupation. Um, and, and, and so that, that what, in our, my view, was, 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 was an outstanding achievement. And then, again, civil society picked it up from there uh, and, and ensured that there is a comprehensive review of the Constitution. I think one of the things that had been taken for granted is that as long as, you know, these democratic ideals are, 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 are included in the Constitution or spelt out uh, in the supreme law that uh, it, 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 it will guarantee that those rights are respected, that uh, uh, the national values and principles of governance in Article 10, including, you know, rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, you know, uh, national unity will be guaranteed. Uh, and I think this is where um, um, the, the civil society uh, got its hands off, off the deck. And, and I think we need to come back to that. Because uh, taking that again to the issue of term limits, uh, and whenever I engage you know, ordinary Kenyans about term limits, or whenever Kenyans have an opportunity to speak on national radio stations, uh, TV stations, and the rest, you get a sense that Kenyans do not sufficiently appreciate why the term limit. Uh, because um, quite often you hear people suggesting that even uh, as lowly you know, elected leaders as, as, as members of county assembly, I think in Uganda, those will be, you know, councillors, if at all, you still have such titles, uh, that, that, that they, those should also have term limits. And, and so you get a sense that um, not many Kenyans appreciate um, the, the, the whole concept of term limits and why it is important and why it is only limited to uh, two executive offices in Kenya. Um, and I say that because uh, Article 142 uh, B um, of the Kenyan Constitution um, is the one that provides that a person shall not serve for, uh, as president for more than two terms. And, and again, that is uh, provided for in Article 180, um, uh, sub Article 7 uh, of the Constitution with respect to governors and, and, and deputy governors. And so Kenyans need to appreciate that the only reason why there is a capping on the period that certain persons and holders of certain offices uh, can, must serve for only a limited period of time is because the powers that they hold um, are so enormous that if allowed to consolidate and entrench themselves, uh, then uh, that power will get into their head and they are likely uh, to use it to the disadvantage uh, and abuse of the people. And so that for me is a role that civil society needs to play, educating the people on why term limits, because not, not everybody does appreciate that. And that's why perhaps some of them are suggesting that it be extended to include all elective offices. Um, of course, it would be a good thing if uh, you know, people are able to change uh, holders of office uh, at, 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 at every election. Secondly, is to point out that um, when our constitution in Article 1 says that sovereign power belongs to the people, uh, then the people need also to be educated to say that, uh, yes, uh, the constitution goes further to say that we can exercise as citizens uh, those powers directly or indirectly through elected leaders. And, and, and so the people that we delegate that power to, um, including you know, presidents and governors, 
who are serving under term limits must exercise that authority only in accordance with the constitution. And so when they begin to come up with ideas of, of, of extending that, uh, then the people need to be told that, and educated to sufficiently appreciate that um, um, when you know, people hold office for uh, longer than the, the term limits, then uh, the values and principles of governance uh, that I've alluded to and which are provided for in, in Article 10 take, take, take a back seat. Uh, good governance, uh, you would say, you know, uh, is one of the, would be one of the casualties. In, in multi-ethnic communities like ours, uh, and in, in, as indeed most of African countries, uh, the regularity with which people are able to change leadership ensures that there is national unity. Uh, because when an individual, uh, and of course coming from a particular ethnic background, uh, stays in office like it has happened in, uh, like it happened in Kenya during the reign of you know, the first uh, president of this republic, the second, and now in Uganda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I would want us to um, accept that as civil society leaders, we have a responsibility to educate the public and citizens in general on the implications of breach or abrogation of term limit because uh, our constitution is founded on the evolution of power and therefore when people you know come and go then it creates, it creates more opportunities to share and evolve that power and of course if democracy is ruled by of the people uh, by the people and for the people uh, then, then, then then term limits is 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 is, is, is inevitable and, and, and therefore, um, uh, we, we affirm that democracy, though not perfect, remains the only viable um, form of government that, that, that Kenyans, Ugandans, Tanzanians, and, and indeed the whole of humankind um, can embrace for the time being. Uh, then we must ensure that you know, term limits are respected. And of course, you all know that the common thread in our constitution is public participation and, and when people go to the vote, the, the, the whole exercise of, of electioneering, you know, enabling people to make a choice between alternatives. And I think that, that for me is very, very critical. Uh, and, and as I finish, you know, uh, term limits ensure that, you know, the value and principle of inclusiveness, uh, allowing people to rotate in, in, in those offices, uh, it, uh, it's also guaranteed. And, and, and finally, as I finish, because I can see you have alerted me uh, to wind up, we have this fundamental principle of protection of the marginalized. It is only through pub, uh, term limits and, 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 and adhering, strict adherence to term limits, that uh, those that have been traditionally marginalized from leadership, including ethnic minorities like the Pokot, um, can get a chance. Uh, today's uh, Siri Ramaphosa of, of South Africa, you know, hails from one of the tiny ethnic communities, but because of the capacity of the South African democracy uh, to, to, to allow rotation of leadership through term limits, um, Samaphosa has been able to ascend to the highest office of the land, and that for me is very critical ingredient of, of term limits. Thank you. Let's cross over to, can, can Victor, is Victor there? I can see Victor online. Yes, oh, I'm lost online. Him. Victor. No, I'm, I'm around. Victor is online. I, I think I can see Victor. Victor, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now. Ah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Yes, the role of the media. Do you think the media is playing an effective role in consolidating democracy in the country, especially when it comes to these presidential term limits? We've seen the debates uh, it is he said, she said from the media, but we've not seen a very, you know, in-depth analysis in making sure the citizenry understand the role or the role of media in addressing this presidential term limits. What is your take on this? Thank you. Thank you. Demo. Now, uh, media has done what is practically possible uh, in terms of engagement, but uh, as you, you, you start noticing, other than the Moi transition, uh, the term limit has not been a major, major, uh, I mean, issue in the country, other than, again, uh, the likes of those who are suggesting that uh, the current president is too young so, so, so to, to retire. But, but the media has been very consistent, obviously, with uh, other limitations. 
but they have been very consistent. Media has always been on the side of constitutionalism, uh, rule of law, and respect for, uh, for, for democracy. And they have done. Obviously, uh, when we are looking at media, is that uh, also remember that we have a media that, that, uh, that has journalists who come from particular tribes. We have journalists, a media which is owned by particular individuals who lean towards particular uh, sides. And that also makes the debate uh, around this topic. Uh, because if you looked at 2013, you looked at 2017, you start seeing, and even now, as you start, even look at the constitutional, uh, the, the referendum 205, you would see mm. a number of media houses that supported either no or yes. And we, we are currently seeing it. So we're also not talking about a uniform media, but, but, but uh, uh, on a general note, uh, in terms of what we're happening, in the terms of the agenda setting, media is very critical in the provision of information that would allow uh, citizens either engage uh, with the debate on the constitutional uh, limits. So for this reason, uh, and if such a debate were to start in the country, then media has a bigger responsibility to, to provide a bigger space around the issue of what the constitution says about uh, term limits. Uh, in addition to our own constitution, what is the practice? Uh, look at the 20, nearly 22 countries that in Africa that have tried uh, to, uh, to, to tamper with the presidential limits and what has been the repercussions. In nearly uh, the, the 22 or so countries, 19 of them, the, the, the attempts to change the constitutional uh, term limits led to chaos in those countries. So these are the, the, the case studies that our media should be uh, using in terms of their discussions around if anybody started such a uh, weird thinking about tampering with our presidential uh, term limits. The issue, the media must provide information around the issue of what are the international standards? What are other people doing? I mean, what are these, like I mentioned earlier, what does the AU uh, Convention on Term Limits say, for example? And Kenya is a member of that. Uganda is a member. What, what, if you looked at the Lomé Convention on, on Term Limits, Rule of Law and Democracy, what does it say? The African Charter for People and Human Rights, what does it say? And obviously now there is a Niamey Convention on, on, on Term Limits. So there are quite a number of documentations that media would use to hold those who might think otherwise uh, accountable, uh, provide information because for citizens to interact, for citizens to make those decisions, they need this kind of information that we are going against our own constitution, we are going against yeah. all best practices around, we are going again, we are not even looking at what the 22 countries tried, those who tried to change their term limits, what ended up in those countries. So by providing such case studies, such discussion, whenever people start engaging robustly in a discussion around uh, the presidential, uh, presidential term limits, the issue of agenda right. setting again uh, what agenda are we i mean in addition the issue of gatekeeping what type of information for example do we still continue giving people who want to give that discussion around allowing tempering of term limits what that, even using your own editorial discretion what do we do with such people who want to start debates that would would tamper with our democratization process would tamper with our constitutional provisions would tamper with international and local uh, provision around term limits and uh, like my colleagues have already mentioned we need the, the reason for change is that we are uh, how many millions of kenya are we and if you have served us for 10 years then we need new ideas i mean just like in other places so people must just respect and move on to allow new other ideas new new manifestos that we can see and for that reason the issue of uh, i mean uh, to, to 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 indicate uh, because there is also the issue of perception but because mm. if, and, and one of the things people have raised that even in our own, own country is that how do you expect others to follow the rule of law if government itself is not following the rule of law? How do people look at such things? If in one thank case, you. yeah. Thank you, thank, thank you, Victor. But uh, maybe just to latch on something that uh, you, you've mentioned, and I wanted just to get a uh, deeper understanding because what I hear is uh, democratization through media, but studies which have addressed the relationship between the media and, the, and politics in democratization context usually have two major concerns. One is what you've mentioned, democratization through the media and democratization of the media itself. Because we currently, especially here in the country, we know a lot of media houses, they, you know, they're sole proprietors or they're owned by, you know, individuals. So how then do you entrench democracy within these particular media houses? Because all of them, they have also, uh, you know, they're leaning towards certain, you know, political uh, ideology or certain political, you know, uh, formation. 
and this will be the agenda of this particular media. So everyone actually, not only here in the country, but even abroad in the US, you can see this is really happening, that you'll have one certain media driving this particular agenda and the other media driving another narrative. Where is democratization of media itself here in the country? As you speak very briefly. I think what is happening is that journalists must, remember media is a whole sector, but journalists are the key pe people in the media that drive some of these discussions we are talking about. Marketers, circulation, uh, other sectors, IT in the media do not. So the, 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 the discretion and, and the professional obligation on the democratization process is around the editorial content of our media houses. And, and, and we play, uh, we, we limit, a big way if we're going to limit our discussion around who owns the media I work for, who own, because media has been democratized. With the, uh, with the onset of, of, of online media, people are now owning YouTube. We had a discussion with you, for example, when you were living in TV, and we said, uh, I mean, being a journalist does not limit you to working in a mainstream media, because people have also tended to, to limit the discussion about media on the big five, on the mainstream media and all. Forgetting that we have people now who have a million followers on their YouTube, for example, and Facebook, and those are big media houses that even our not so the, the, the discussion is those of us who are in journalism whether you are in the mainstream media or outside you can still drive this debate on your online platform on your youtube radio on other means and continuously make people uh, have a discussion on public interest issues the discussion should not end at a media house having killed your story I mean, if, for example, you work in a particular media house and your story has been killed, you as a journalist who care about public interest, including time limits and respect for law, how, how do you share this story with a colleague in another media house who can allow that discussion? In a colleague mm -hmm. who has, uh, for example, an online uh, presence that can continuously still uh, enable this discussion uh, to go on. Because the thing is, a number of journalists still want to live with the exclusiveness that if a story, it must be me, it must be my, my, my byline. But, but some of us have grown beyond bylines. Is the story about public interest? Okay. Yes. Has my media house killed it? How else do I share this story with others? I publish a lot yeah. of stories from colleagues from Rwanda, from Tanzania. They give me those stories and I publish them using my byline, but the stories are not mine necessarily because the bigger issue is that how do we bring this debate on the public domain irrespective of who is the byline owner? So journalism must also start working beyond just byline. The issue of collaboration with civil society and others, religious leaders, there must be collaboration, collaborations of purpose, mm -hmm. collaboration that can help people mingle around and play around are, are away from the ownership thank of you. media so that we don't limit our discussion to media ownership. Right, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you uh, for your sentiments there. Uh, let me just drop in uh, Crispin and uh, in, uh, Imam as well. Uh, we we'll begin with you, Crispin. There is a new proposal by the Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee also to reintroduce the extension of term of parliament from the current five to seven years. Um, and this has been opposed by a section of legislators. You in Uganda, as uh, a civil society, what is your sentiment on this? I know we're on a presidential term limit, but we can see now they're going in tandem. It's like we're having two uh, peas in a pod right now. If we're extending the presidential term limit, also we'll have you know, Parliament also seeking to extend their limits and that we have that debate as well here in the country. So what are you critically doing to address this particular uh, notion in Uganda? Crispin, briefly. Well, I mean, that is something that uh, was a part of the entire package to in removing the, 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 the age limit in 2017. And uh, uh, civil mm -hmm. society and uh, political parties pushed back vehement. And uh, I think like uh, one of the uh, facilitators mentioned that uh, when something is happening in, your, in a neighboring country, be careful, it could be at your doorstep in a, in a minute. Um, and and, and uh, the case that was being quoted was uh, Rwanda. Rwanda has, uh, you know, seven year uh, terms. So why not, why can't we have that in Uganda? And uh, that's something that we pushed back. But I know it's not uh, entirely over. Uh, because there's quite a number of machinations happening. I especially, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very, I, my gut feeling is that after the 2021 general elections, this debate is going to come back and uh, we'll have to deal with it just like we did um, uh, in the 2017 uh, campaign for the uh, uh, removal of the, the age limit. So basically, I mean, what I would say is that uh, the, 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 the whole point of, uh, it's, it's, it's going beyond 
just the presidency. It, it, it's, it's, it, this is also a sweetener for the members of parliament because uh, when, it's, uh, when the terms are extended to seven years, or oh, they take care of uh, the president, they take care of the members of parliament, they take care of the district councils, and so on and so forth. So the appetite for a seven-year term might be higher for individual reasons. But of course, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, arbiters of uh, the, uh, the democratic discourse, I think we have uh, arms, uh, arms ready to push back. All right, thank you. Thank you, Crispin. But uh, I tend to wonder what is really happening in Africa, because when we look at uh, Senegal, we have them also uh, gagging to change their constitution, but not to re really extend the presidential term. But President Maki right now is seeking to actually limit the presidential or to bring down the, the, the years, the, the, term, the term of uh, the presidential uh, limit in uh, Senegal from actually seven to around five. While other countries are pushing ahead to increase the number, Senegal is pushing down the numbers. What are they doing or what are they having, especially in their minds when it comes to presidential term limit? Because Senegal, as it is right now, we could say is the epitome of democracy in Africa. Imam, if you can hear me. Uh, I think it depends, as you said, in what we have gone through. I wanted to first of all make a simple comment on what uh, Victor expressed, you see. Uh, the press or the mass media has had a problem because uh, most of our journalists, most the majority of them are really survivors. They are picking from hand to mouth and therefore uh, sometimes they fail to bring out critical issues. Even hosting people uh, on, some, uh, on, uh, on some of these media houses to discuss some of these issues becomes uh, somehow uh, halted because they think if uh, they, they, they are, they are, they, they are visitors uh, voice out something that contradicts what the main state is wishing for, uh, their bread may be cut down. And as you have known, and as he has rightly said so, most media is owned by politicians, both in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, for their own selfish interests, not for the real uh, the development of the state or for the media to serve as the first estate. Therefore, on the Last issue you have brought in, you see. The problem why our people want to prolong, it is because even within these institutions, the political institutions, the political parties, democracy has not grown, okay? It is lacking. Every other time, if you, you saw here, for example, in the ruling party in Uganda previously, uh, the, the Secretary General was elected through a popular vote, but these days he's nominated by the chairman of the party. And all those are deliberately intended for really to protect their own interests, not to, to pursue uh, the development of the state. Maybe Senegal we are talking about, it may, it, it, it may be learning, you see, from the experiences that they have gone through, or their neighbors have gone through, uh, mm. or they are also borrowing from those other countries where uh, the, 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 the the, the limits or the terms are either uh, four year or something like that, so that they feel that uh, maybe the more people you bring in uh, to in the discourse of uh, building your nation, probably uh, uh, the better. Therefore, uh, in this case, uh, I, I would think, for example, religious institutions, unless the leaders in the religious institutions uh, come out and speak loud and clear, okay? It will be very, very hard for them to influence uh, power uh, through constitutional means, okay? And they should be loud, they should be bold enough, and they should uh, uh, tackle issues of uh, national interest. And probably they are the most strategically located group to carry this message. Why? We interact with our followers day in and day out, okay? Day in and day out, there are services here and there. Uh, when there is a funeral, you will find them there. If there is, a, it is baptism. There is, there is something there. If there is any ceremony within wedding, they, they, they are there. Therefore, we actually religious leaders hold a big stake uh, in in influencing this activity. If uh, they really also came out of their shells and they 
appreciated that their services for the people, not for just for leaders yeah, in Thank case uh, of, their, of their own personal interests. Thank you. All right, uh, Imam, I, I hinted to you that I'll ask you this question about your interest also for the presidency, because in 2011, you were also uh, running for presidency I, and uh, I, Justice I, Forum Party. I, I think to. That is not true. That is, is not true. true. Somebody, somebody recorded it. That's not true because I, I, I am a political observer and interested in the politics of not only Uganda, but I am not for competitive politics because I don't have that thinking of thinking that I, if I have to influence any issues in my country, I must have a political office. Okay. All right. That so, so was, that I was just saying, it was not true. I saw it, I read it, but even the person who reported it asked him, I, where did he get it? And uh, me, I, I don't have a spokesman. I speak for thank myself. You. Right, thank you. But, so you don't have any flash of interest to actually run for presidency whatsoever? No, not in the short no. run. Not in the no, circumstances okay. in which we operate. Because you, you see, the, the political systems in this country is not uh, well developed for a free thinker like myself. Maybe I should also just latch deeper uh, on this issue of religion, because the Inter-Religious uh, Council of Uganda uh, yeah. held also a presidential debate, I think on January 2015, when we were actually getting to this current uh, uh, tenure as well. Yes. What's the subject, or now do you, are you all the wiser in trying to also broach this subject of presidential term limits in the debate? Yeah. I I, I know it, 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 when when you meet them uh, as a group, they tend to express it. But when they go individually, uh, they okay. hack so much on what is private to them. You see, Interreligious Council of Uganda is there, but uh, mm -hmm. when you see what is done later, when they see whether they visit the president as a separate entity, you see the Muslim will ask for what he wants, the Catholic Church will ask for what he wants. And the, the, the protestant uh, will say whatever he wants. Then the, the, the born again movement has also come in, he's on board. Uh, so, uh, but I think uh, if you ask me, Imam Kasoza as a person, and many of my colleagues, we still believe that it is important to have the term limits, even the age limits, because even all the religious groupings here, they have age limits. And uh, for example, in our case of the Muslim community, our constitution did have age limit, but did not have uh, uh, term limits. Uh, Thank you. But now, I intend to start in because example. of time. Uh, no, for, for, in because of time. for example, it was clearly expressed that we should, do, we should have uh, term limits because uh, more people stay longer, the weaker they become in uh, administering issues of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Idi. I have to interpose there because of all interest of time as well. Uh, we want also our participants to get a handy opportunity to ask their questions uh, as well. But allow me briefly to just cross over to Caroline. It will be very important uh, and it will be remiss of me if I don't really mention this on this forum uh, as well. I think Victor also hinted on this. Uh, when it comes to institutional bodies like AU and also the East African Council, We've seen they've been milly mouthed a bit and they've not taken a strong stance in addressing presidential term limits simply because most of his leaders also are in, a, in these particular bodies. So where do you strike a balance that you can address these term limits and say, yes, we have our African charter that speaks also loudly on the presidential term limits. And yet the application of it is diametrically different as we can see on the ground. Carola? Thanks, Dibal. I think one of the things to look at is the environment that must exist before uh, a, a, an incumbent can attempt to can attempt to do away with team lim with term limits. You find that uh, before that happens, there is uh, a level in which, for example, the independence of the judiciary is affected. There is a level in which the emasculation of a parliament or um, must happen. There's a level in which civic space um, must shrink. In other words, we must first um, create an enabling environment for the powers that be to be able to achieve their agenda. And so part of that then is where um, bodies like the AU then become 
uh, voiceless because you'll then be arguing that it's the people, it's the people that have decided. And so if a majority in parliament has decided to pass like they did in Uganda to do away with term limit or in other cases mm -hmm. like Burundi where a parliament has passed um, to allow for, to, to remove term limits absolutely, then that um, international uh, or regional body's role then becomes weakened because then it becomes like you're, you're exercising sovereign power as your country and your representatives are exercising sovereign power on your behalf by allowing for term limits. So I think for me, what, what is important is to ensure that the, the environment that facilitates for this either removal or extension of term limits does not exist. In other words, the independence of institutions, including the AU, must be protected at all costs. The independence even of the media, of, of an, an, an enabling environment for civil society, independence of the judiciary, independence and democracy within political parties must be allowed to thrive. And it's important, there's something that you mentioned that when we think, or Suba, I think it's Suba who mentioned that when you think about term limits, you're also mm -hmm. just thinking about presidents. But in our case, in the country, for example, now, we have over 14, 15 governors whose two term limits are coming to an end. What, yes, what, yes. It, what incentives would they be given, for example, to support an extension of their terms? What, what incentives would, they, would be provided? And so when you look at it in the holistic context of um, either in incentivizing people to support uh, your, your stand or creating a hostile environment for those that would be seen to be opposed or mm -hmm. controlling, um, ensuring that you have control of key institutions that would call you out, you know, should you want to extend the terms, it then becomes critical. And then given that context, ensuring then that you have the support of um, institutions such as the AU. And you've seen even, um, you know, uh, lobbying, um, not, not necessarily lobbying, but getting the support of, of your peers within the sector. And you've seen even now, what, what happens is you don't find a lot of the African peers, the African presidents calling out their mates when these things uh, happen, you know, when they appear in other countries, because, you know, it provides an opportunity for, um, it, it provides an opportunity for justification of, of such things. And you've seen even where countries, you know, we've talked about Burundi, we've talked about Rwanda, the presidents have gone on to take on AU leadership in subsequent years without as yes. much as a, a slap on the wrist from, the, from their peers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, which maybe whittles down, you know, this particular institutional bodies to members club, because how then uh, do we justify having EAC, e e we having EAC as it is, and also how then do we justify AU if they cannot address such critical questions like you know uh, breaching the presidential term limits, even when they have that enshrined in the charter. As well. e e yeah, me... exactly. And, and, and vested, vested interests in the processes, you know, so that mm -hmm. you, you don't call out your peers because the same thing you could probably be contemplating doing the same thing in your country. And if you look at the number of countries that you have mentioned in Africa that have extended term limits, then it already points to a weakness within the AU um, in enforcing the observance of term limits. Yeah. Also in the ESSC, we know three of them. We have two now twiddling their thumbs. And here we are also maybe debating about the presidential term limits. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Under the guise of, you know, some, some initiatives uh, that uh, we are all aware of. But let me just rope in Suba and then we close uh, uh, on the panel and we cross over to the participants because they have a lot of questions for you. And I can see time is ticking away from us. You, we've had Victor mentioning uh, the near May declaration. And we all know what is enshrined there, that the belief that respect for constitution term limits is an essential element of creating stable, pro prosperous democracies in Africa. And I went through that particular list, and I can see at least Kenya is leading in, in terms of people who have joined in and pledged their support for constitutional term limits in Africa. But Uganda, we just have only one pledge. So the question is, when we have these declarations that are here and uh, we have the civil society, what, what, is your, what, what, what is your role in terms of stream rolling such declarations, uh, you know, 
and making sure that we have citizens who are aware about these declarations so they can chime in, they can join and pledge and move steam, full steam ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Dibal. I, I think I'll start up from, uh, I'll pick it up from your question earlier. Why in most of African states, um, most presidents would want to extend their term, term in office um, and tie it in with the issue, um, the development in, in Senegal, for example, where yes, yes, please. Uh, yes, Macky please. Sall is, is actually shortening it. Most of these presidents, uh, want to extend because they feel insecure. Um, they have a sense of insecurity that if, because you know, in most uh, countries, and, and, and Kenya included, and I think even Uganda, um, a person cannot be charged um, for, for, for alleged crime while still in office. And so because they have um, abused power, um, most of them, uh, live permanently haunted by the fear of being arraigned in courts. Uh, and you know, when you have served as president and you are used to all these lajis, you are, you, your word is law, and then you become a very subject of that very law. Uh, a lot of them um, want to stay on because that is the only way they can guarantee themselves and, and, and their cronies and families that they'll not be arraigned in court and charged with the offenses that they, they committed, uh, either against the people or against the law uh, while in office. Uh, of course, there is in, in, in democratic discourse, uh, what has become known as best practices. And I think what is guiding the leadership in um, Senegal is to say, look, there are countries like uh, uh, the US where it is even four years, why seven, which is almost double what they have as, as one term in the US. And so it's time to make adjustments to fit within uh, best practices across the world. Uh, my mm -hmm. only question though, as he does that, is that it must be done with the approval of the people. Uh, because when people, when he carries the people along with him, uh, then the people get to own the outcome of such a process. Uh, because in Africa, we have had, you know, uh, we are multi-ethnic and only certain communities uh, have, have produced presidents, as they always say. Uh, if, if, if it does not carry along uh, the people in their majority, then any person who will come from a community in Senegal that has not had uh, to, to, uh, opportunity to hold the presidency, might want, might be tempted to revert because they're saying this is our only chance. We are not sure of getting it again. And that's why for me, uh, even though good as it is, it, it must be done in the most democratic and most participatory so that there is democratic ownership uh, of that. But coming back to Africa and, and all these democratic ideals, you know, charters and declarations, you know, all these good ideas remain lofty as long as African countries retain this policy of non-interference in internal affairs of member states. Because yes, I mean, there'll be those declarations and then a rogue president decides to do what he or she wants to do. Most of them are he. Um, then, then, then the neighboring countries, you know, are, are, are kind of hamstrung by this uh, unstated, but the obvious policy of non-interference. And I think it is, it is a, it's a notion we have retained even after we, we renamed the Organization of African Unity into AU. I, I think yes. it, is, it, is, it is something that we should have left with the OAU uh, as we embrace the African Union because African Union should have come with the new democratic ideals that most African countries espouse. And so I think the role that civil society needs to play in this thank is you, to ensure you. that citizens are sufficiently not just educated, but are organized enough to resist uh, some of these temptations by uh, sitting heads of state to thank overstay you, you, their welcome. And, and, and I think that is something that civil society can do. Uh, they should mm -hmm. not look to the African Union. The African Union has always, you know, treated, you know, the, the, their colleagues because, as you rightly pointed out, it's a club of heads of states and governments. They have always treated each other with velvet gloves. They have always looked to each other for business across the borders, you know, you. Uh, 
through bilateral or multilateral frameworks. And, and so it is upon citizens to ensure that, you know, such heads of state and governments are held to account by organizing citizens to, to, to resist in massive numbers. Uh, some thank of you, thank you, Stuber. Uh, thank, you, thank, you thank you. Thank you. Because of interest of time, I think you've really laid it on the thick. Uh, we get the picture. We have uh, a lot of questions. And uh, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, time is uh, really not on our side. We are strapped for time. I wanted just to, you know, tease out some of the questions that I hear and uh, uh, throw them to the relevant panelists. Let's just begin with the uh, media because we have Ntale uh, Bonifance who is saying that my name is Boni from Uganda. Uh, he says in Uganda, many media houses are owned by politicians and this has caused limited input of the media role in, taking, in talking about matters of politics, more of anything that is opposing the government. So how can media in Uganda help to participate well and I think I'll tie that with uh, I'm Vesi Andrew Cohen, who's saying, my name is Andrew Cohen, I'm Vesi, a red paper journalist in Arua, Uganda. I'm so grateful for this discussion. However, my view is that in Uganda, the media is under siege. We have a situation where Uganda Communications Commission threatens to withdraw licenses of media houses that broadcast information deemed to portray the ruling government negatively. Point in time was when UCC bad live broadcast all the presidential led limit debate in parliament, which later turned into uh, a fierce fight. Besides, many journalists have been threatened by state agencies for publishing what they feel is not in favor of the government. Much as we have been given space to operate, I think the media freedom has not yet been granted fully by the state in Uganda. I thank you. That is Ambesi. I think that is uh, related to media. And uh, maybe I'll just give this opportunity to you, uh, Victor Buire, so that you can address this. And I think there's another one, maybe just to tie it up so that we can finish up uh, at least with the media. We have admin saying here, thank you for all the wonderful presentations, but I have something for Victor Buire, especially when he said the media needs to go a little deeper in making the citizens understand well issues around the presidential term limits in Africa. How do you think the media can do it better meets the shrinking media freedom and space where not only media houses are being targeted, but also critical journalists as well. For example, in Uganda, state institutions like the police, Uganda Communications uh, Commission, are uh, used to issue un unconstitutional directives. In fact, some journalists were forced to resign from their work or not to host a particular program on the order of these institutions during the age limit debates in Uganda. This is Benedict uh, from Uganda. Victor. Thank you, Debal. Uh, one uh, quickly, like you mentioned, the first thing on which you are aware is that journalism is not for the faint-hearted. There is nobody mm -hmm. who would allow journalists uh, uh, free space. And, and global uh, media state tensions have been global, they have been documented. And even if you looked at the history of what we are talking about, uh, why is Onyango Bo, for example, why did Onyango Bo have to relocate to Kenya, for example? I mean, and others look at uh, Pius Nyamora, they had to relocate to the US. So, so the history of journalists who, are, who have stand bold has always been the same. The tensions are there. Journalists must be prepared for that. That's the career you chose. And, and, and while you take care of your life, but, but the fact that you can face them. I mean, I like Charles Onyango, but he still writes on Uganda as if he stays in Kampala, yet he's in Kenya. He had to change tact. So journalists must also develop tact on how else do we do these things. I have told you before, we have a number of articles from some of our countries that we do with our bylines that are not necessarily ours. So journalism has also uh, embraced uh, uh, new ways of doing things so that the public good. The problem I said, journalists were sometimes very selfish. The story must contain your byline. The story must be you. But once we find that we can work collaboratively with others and, and see where else can we get this story published outside there, we, we will manage it. I mean, the, the, the things, and it's, sorry, I've been I just uh, from Kampala a few uh, months ago, and we are in a discussion. The things that uh, UCC, Uganda Media Council, uh, the, 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 the Media Monitoring Department, uh, the, the, the Director of Criminal Investigations are doing, the similar things happening in Tanzania. I can tell you even in Kenya, in 2013, you remember, the Communication Authority of Kenya released guidelines on, on, on political advertising, on SMS, bulk SMSs, Remember jointly, the uh, National Cohesion and Integration Commission and, 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 and CA again released other uh, guidelines on hate speech and related 
uh, the IBC and CA also released guidelines on, on media coverage. So these things are standard. I mean, the thing is, how else do we operate? It's not unique to Uganda what some of those laws are, are, are doing, some of those uh, provisions are doing. But media must work with other colleagues to sue, to take legal action against UCC, against uh, government agencies that have been used to harass journals and limit their limitation. The issue of ownership is a challenge, yes, but remember, like Imam said, even the religious organizations own radio stations and the TV stations. How have we used those stations that are not owned by politicians to still propagate the same discussion we're having? Because if politicians, for example, own stations, what about religious institutions? What about community radio stations that are, are existing? How else have we utilized them? CSO, civil society has a radio station. I know UMA has a radio station and others. So we should not get stuck in blaming and crying about politicians will never give us space, free space to do what we want. We must, as journalists, fight for our space through either uh, mainstream media, alternative media, and other means, because this has been global. Look at the US. The, the biggest person who is harassing journalists is Trump. We have seen with his fake news, fake whatever. He has, has opened a war against, I mean, brands, uh, brands like CNN and the rest. So it's not limited. Look at Tanzania. Look at other countries in Kenya. So the thing is that this is a profession we chose, and we must find ways we must find means of, uh, of of still doing our work without necessarily lamenting, aware of the challenges yeah. that are there, and we are not saying there are no challenges, but we must go deeper. Journalists must not think, it's wrong for journalists to think that journalism is an easy work, just to get a person and host in the studio. It, it goes beyond just doing that. It goes beyond looking at risk analysis of that story, look, reading documents and documents. I mean, for how many times, Adamal, have we heard about the Nehemiah Convention or presidential term limits, for example, when journalists are doing these stories, do they mention the weaknesses of AU like we are mentioning here? You know, that, that gives, there's nothing dangerous about mentioning that when M7, for example, tempers with term limits, is going against the AU uh, convention, the Lome convention, the Niame convention. I wouldn't think anybody will be, but we see chunks and chunks of articles and debates on political developments in our country without contextualizing, without our journalists going beyond and giving a background on even those current affairs news we are doing, even those feature stories we are doing, even those other stories we are doing on development. How do we else creatively bring in debates around uh, current issues that must shape where we are going. Thank we you. cannot continue yeah. lamenting. We are not the book of thank lamentation, you. please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Victor. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, then so, uh, we have uh, Felix Warom, and uh, I think this will go to Crispin. He says, it's unfortunate that the MPs are in parliament to implement the vision of one man, in brackets from 70, to cling to power forever by removing both age and time limits. What can civil society in Uganda do in order to bring back this debate to restore uh, that in the constitution? This is what Felix Waromi is asking. Like I said before, I think, uh, I think civil society has to invest more in building uh, a stronger circle of trust that goes beyond uh, civil society itself to put the citizen at the center, to have political parties in that, uh, in that circle of trust, uh, to have the media, to have the key uh, state institutions. I think civil society traditionally has, has liked to work in isolation to protect its uh, civil society and uh, citizen issues. Political issues are not, not those uh, where you can work in exclusivity. Uh, you, can, you can't deliver when you're working in isolation. So, I mean, because today it will be an attack on civil society, tomorrow it will be an attack on the media, to, the other day it will be an attack on political parties, like we've actually been seeing. So I think the more we learn to stand side by side with each other as partners, um, uh, the, the more we then will realize the dividends that we're working for. And uh, I think from, for Uganda particularly, we are living either with us or against us. So under such a context, what pays off is actually making advocacy issues about citizens rather than... I'll come back to you. But uh, 2022 general elections, uh, with some unconfirmed information on creation of posts, or political psycho friends and Hello. psycho leaders. I think I'm out. The point is to maintain President Uhuru in the new formation. What's the take of you on this? Is it on is it is it not in one way extension of political terms, so to speak, if not presidential term, but in a different capacity? 
Right, you got the gist of uh, the question. Uh, this is uh, Caroline. It is indeed an attempt to extend the term, and it's what I alluded to earlier, that in the context of constitutional yes. reforms, the mischief has been to then include some transitional clauses that then extend the incumbent term. And some, I think it was at the beginning, we had how um, after the multipartism came into play, we then disregarded the fact that the president, the then president Moy had already been on office for 14, for 14 years. And there was an argument that mm. this was a new constitutional dispensation. And therefore he had a right to, to, to run for office for an additional two terms. So I'll not be surprised that this is, um, applying the same mischief and is indeed an extension of um, a term through the so-called constitutional reforms. And we've seen, and I, I think it would really be setting a bad precedent if we, it was allowed to go through, because what would then happen is at any given time when someone's term is coming to an end, um, then mm -hmm. you just in institute these constitutional reforms. And like I alluded to earlier, and probably also attempting to borrow the same mischief from Uganda, where they are talking about extending the same uh, kind of parliament, I think the risk is mm -hmm. providing or extending these incentives to other actors in the governance sector that then lead to credence and support for the move. And for me, I think that is something that civil society organizations must stand up and sensitize citizens against. Uh, it says, Imam Idi Kasozi, this is Alan Richard Odoch. I agree with you that religion is purely a political matter, but the challenges like any other CSO, the civic space is very limited and constantly changing. CSOs need to work more on social capital development and seek independence from political alignment in order to play its role in political advocacy I think it's a contribution, but you can weigh in on that just briefly. Also, just hang on so that you can, uh, we can cognate that with another question. We have uh, Nyanyanzi Proskovia Kabanda, who is saying, in Uganda, we have a pending motion about seven-year term from five years. So don't you think we will be in the same situation after 2021 elections? Also, you can just weigh on that as a trend uh, get some other questions that uh, okay. are just ho hovering on that particular issue as well. Uh, I think this goes Mom. back to the whole idea when you mentioned about institutions like AU and the like. The reason I think why it, 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 who is debating these issues? We have left it to the politicians who are looking, who are seeking for the positions. Uh, we need, I think, to have to create some expert groups uh, which mm. should be the ones responsible to discuss and debate these uh, uh, the, these changes that we want to see, so that yes. they are really pro people rather than uh, bring them to ourselves. Uh, look, if you even the AU, those people who are occupying the, the offices there, who appointed them, they are the political leaders of our countries. They nominate their own. They don't nominate people who have expertise in some areas, and therefore, uh, what we see. If I am not pushing for my boss, I'm pushing for myself. Therefore, I entirely agree with the Odoch who said we need economic independence uh, by probably investing or using what we have to ensure that uh, we move on rather than thinking. And also as religious leaders, ours is not materialism because the reason why we have fallen into that trap, it is because we have now also become like uh, lovers of material wealth, even in the academia, uh, in, even in the academia, because previously professors were professing knowledge, but, knowledge. but these days uh, they want also to have creates a lot of wealth around them so that they are respected for that. Why? It is because of the culture of the, our people, the way they look at those who have and those who have not, okay? And also trying to replace uh, the value of education, for example, to be uh, underscored, and then we look at value of accumulated wealth as the issue of the day. And the reason is because it is poverty that prevails all over. Unless we worked out, we work out on that one, we shall not move. The last thing I want to add on that is corruption in many of our countries is almost institutionalized. The extent that even institutions that should be fighting corruption, they are corrupt themselves. 
And therefore, this brings a dilemma as to which direction we should take. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Imam. Super Church, and there's one for you from uh, Nyanyanzi Proskovia Kabanda. And he's asking, Super Churchill, yes, we will ensure the respect of presidential term limits and educate the public about it. But do we have the powers to change what has been changed already? Yes, of course. Um, as they say, um, there is no powerful arm in the world that has ever stopped um, a people that are determined are people that are clear in their mind that what they want is nothing less than the best. So we can change. Um, that change ought not to be drastic. Um, I've seen a lot of talk about um, revolutions, uh, including in Kenya. Um, and, and Kenya happens to be one of those countries where you know, revolutions are talked about even before they happen. Um, and, and so people are getting wary of you know, this talk of revolutions. But I think as, as societies, we have over the years um, created awareness, um, empowered people um, to take charge of their own destinies. And, and mm. so I think that even that which has been changed can be changed. In this country, Kenya, we, we had um, in our co previous constitution, in our old constitution, um, a provision uh, saying that um, Kenya shall be a one party state um, and, 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 and that was inserted in 1982. Uh, mm -hmm. But in 1992, um, that section got removed. And so what has been changed can be changed. Um, and, and it even went further to say even which party it was. Um, and, and it went on to say, and the party shall be the Kenya African National Union. Today, we don't have that. Uh, we, we have a whole new body of laws and, and constitution. Um, that guides us. And I want to believe that uh, even in Uganda, um, even as people, you know, sound a bit desperate, I know there is a sense of despair because of the manner in which um, the authorities there have literally captured institutions that would have provided checks and balances. But citizens through their civil society formations must never ever give up on the hope for change and must work consciously towards uh, achieving that. I have also seen um, a question that uh, perhaps is directed to me by Lempa on the, on the Q&A chat um, that talks, to, talks about you know, why, why we talk about non-interference internal affairs policy in Africa when you know, instruments like the Rome Statute uh, that operate at the international level um, have, 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 have been enforced. Uh, that, that is true. But remember, the, the, this, this non-interference policy is, is, yes, you at one point you'd say it is the national, but I would by and large describe it as a regional uh, policy. And, and because each of our heads of state have um, you know, their own cobwebs in their drawers, um, there is no telling when you'd need the help of that president in the neighborhood who has gone rogue. So most African heads of state you know, would rather keep uh, uh, the, the, their hands off um, in internal affairs because uh, of the, 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 the instability um, that may also rock their own countries and, 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 and they Thank therefore you. look forward to running to those countries. And, and as I finish, again, related to Soinka Lempa's question about why countries like England, you know, are more stable yet they don't have term limits. Um, you know, you cannot, first of all, compare England um, to countries that have term limits because England has uh, one, a parliamentary system that is in charge of government and a monarchy in charge of the state that does not even, you know, uh, stop it within England. It, 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 it covers even Canada. Countries like Canada still look to the Queen of England as, as the head of their state. And so these are countries that have rich traditions that are built on monarchies that have uh, established That's norms bad. that people go by. And, and, and you remember England and the, the UK generally has no codified law. There is no canonized law as such. But people have certain traditions that they have come to live by 
and take as the law. And, and, and so when you, do not, when you are in a country like England that has its pieces of tradition scattered all over the place, but still has that kind of stability, then you would want to see why it is different from countries in Africa that have presidential systems that prescribe uh, term limits. That's what I would say in answer to Lempa's questions. Thank you. So all that uh, in England also predicated on the Magna Carta. Uh, is that so, uh, Churchill Suba? Thank you. All right, let, let, let's hear from uh, James Okora, which, and uh, I think I'll throw this to uh, one to Crispin and then uh, the other to Caroline as well. James asks, what are the benefits of term limits? Can political transitions become a new normal for East African countries? Let's begin with you, Crispin, very briefly. Yes, uh, I think first it is uh, the certainty of uh, succession and political transition that come with, uh, with the term limits. And uh, just to illustrate that, uh, I'll just give you a very, very short story. Um, I think no one enjoys that microscopic scrutiny. No one likes being subjected to a test or an exam. Recently, I had a conversation with two different serving heads of state and one who had lost an election. And they were all cursing whoever introduced this thing called elections. In fact, the two of them shared a similar opinion that if elected, the president should actually be given a term of say about 10 or 15 years and then subjected to another election. So you can see that, I mean, it, it's, it's ingrained in us. We do not want to be scrutinized. And, uh, and, and therefore, nobody would want to even have this, you know, um, these periods, short periods, where you have to go for another election and go for, an, or, or actually have limitations where you cannot be on the ballot anymore. At the end of the day, if you see that it's a game of many, then there has to be certainty in terms of transition. That certainty has to be built in such a way that it's open to as many qualified people as possible. Thank you, thank you, Crispin. Uh, over to you, Caroline. A term limits the stick uh, for good governance. Your thoughts? <clears throat> Thanks, Pibal, and I think they are. If you think about the, I, I, I think they are. We have already alluded to the fact that term limits um, ensure that citizens have, an, have a vested interest in the process. If you have a process where every, there are no term limits, so if somebody is to serve 30, 40 years um, as citizens, you really have no say. I think that would even worsen the situation I already talked to about uh, citizen apathy. So I think term limits have uh, a very instrumental role in ensuring good governance. And if we are talking about, um, you know, government for the people, by the people, and with the people, so the, the people should then have a say in saying who, who, who leads them after every either 10 years or five years as the constitution may provide. We've also said that term limits provide a sense of inclusion because it opens the table to a wide array of actors who have, who have a chance at getting the leadership from across the different countries. Um, and then again, it also broadens, you know, citizen consensus in the sort of leadership that they're having. And so for me, term limits are very instrumental in ensuring that that sense of inclusion, that sense of ownership, that sense of share, shared, shared prosperity, if you may, is entrenched in a country. And most importantly, that sense of creating a government that citizens feel they have a stake in at any given time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let me just throw this to you, uh, Victor. There is uh, Amosias Bazibwe. He's saying, thank you so much. Uh, my name is, I've mentioned the name from Uganda. I own a newspaper company called Ehiwa in Runyakole. But I have been facing challenges of some of uh, politicians threatening to close my business. What do I do, Victor? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, the issue of closure of businesses seems to be running. And like I mentioned before, how many times was Monitor, for example, closed down? How many times did the red paper be, was closed down? In Kenya here, you have seen standard was raided. And so that's why I was saying uh, the first thing is for, uh, for Amos to report such a matter. There are independent institutions. The Human Rights Network of Uganda is working. The Media Council of Uganda. The, I mean, there are a number of colleagues we know, the Law Society of uh, Uganda Law Society, uh, we must learn to fight because, like I mentioned, the journalists must also know who else can defend them. 
And part of this is the human, there are several human rights organizations, chapter four, human rights Uganda, which can protect him. So, so let him share that information with those colleagues uh, for, for, for fear of that. I mean, there are lawyers who are doing pro bono work protecting major freedom. Kat, uh, Catherine is there. I, I can refer him to Catherine, who can help him uh, in, uh, to, to even get an or bail. Or, so, but that should not hinder him from operating. And he should also share those threats to other media houses to cover them. It is part of fighting it. So once he has such press, let him write a press, let's share with us, share with with other people. And we are in talks with Uganda, with Uganda media Council, and we see what can be done because the fear of being closed down or arrested cannot stop us from working. Like we mentioned, we must consistently fight. There are people who are arrested earlier than us, who are jailed, who are fighting for this respect for constitutionalism, rule of law, and democracy. And we must be ready also to pay such uh, prices. So, 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 so like I mentioned, Fear is not part of the DNA of a journalist. Right, I think, uh, uh, you know, time is not really on our side. This has been a, a very rich uh, theme of information for us uh, today. And see also we have a lot of, lot of questions that have not been addressed and comments as well. I can read one last one from Richard uh, Drasik Maku, who is saying, I think the problem in Uganda and Kenya with presidential term limits is that the constitution's being amended be before they are implemented. This is done on the pretext that the countries are young into democracy and still learning it. Right, I think that is well put by Richard there. So I want to give uh, each of us, our panelists, just uh, 30 seconds or uh, your closing remarks. And thank you for that cogent, very insightful discussion we've had on of our roles. And I think each and everyone, media, the civil society, the public, and the religion also is playing a pivotal role in mainstreaming you know, presidential term limits and also consolidating uh, democracy in Africa. Let's just begin with Imam, briefly, your closing remarks. 30 seconds, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank my colleagues for uh, a lot of uh, education they have given to us and the pray that we put it into practice. And maybe winding up by one question I have seen that uh, the problem of the so-called uh, brown envelopes, as well as the cars given to, to religious leaders. Uh, uh, the problem is that even I think the followers in case of religious re leaders, uh, they have also maybe run away or betrayed their leaders. Instead of supporting them to have these needs they want in their day-to-day -day practice, they leave them isolated and as a consequence, because it is a human, a human being instinct, they go to look where they get survival. So the only way, if we want to change that, we must all come on board, support our people, our leaders, work with them, and then help them to challenge uh, the status quo. Thank you. Thank, that you. Is, thank you. 30 seconds are over. Uh, let's hear from Chris Pin as well. Your yeah, closing remarks. 30 seconds, sir. Well, well I think uh, democracy is a package that encompasses the man among other things, uh, free media, democratic elections. So for me, as a central tenet of democracy, term limits encourage that healthy uh, political competition, rotation, devolution of power to institutions and not individuals. And for me, I think these are important. So um, nations with term limits globally always have challenges with their democratization. The elections, mm -hmm. the kind of elections that they hold are purely symbolic and ritual. So for me, I think is in as much as we think about democratization in its entirety, at the center of that has to be that clear succession political transition plan. And the citizens must be at the center. Right. Oh, let's hear from Caroline, your closing remarks. I think for me, it's to say that uh, from the, oh, sorry, yeah. From the conversation, it is very clear that um, accountability, uh, transparency, inclusion are also are very key factors and act as deterrents to abuse of term limits. And so for us is to ask that as civil society organizations, as citizens, as the media, and even as political party actors, it's to ensure that there is, there is these tenets of democracy, accountability, transparency, inclusion and equality are protected and, and therefore entrenching an aspect of term limits is critical for good governance and democracy in Africa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Suba, Chacha, you're closing remarks. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. I, I think for me, 
the only sectors for which um, the democratic ideals of integrity, um, uh, accountability, transparency, inclusive, inclusivity, and all these principles that come with um, uh, term limits. Um, and, and, and the only sector for which those ideals are not a variable, uh, but a constant, um, remain the civil society, remain the religious sector, and independent media. And, and, and therefore, these three sectors must always act in tandem, must always act in unity to ensure that uh, the democratic ideals that our people fought so hard for um, are upheld and defended against machinations of those who want to remove term limits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's hear from uh, also Victor Buire. Victor, your closing remarks. To me is that uh, media will continue and has a bigger role to play, especially on public interest issues, including those term limits, respect for, for, for rule of law, uh, constitutionalism, and the rest. If journalists can prioritize public interest news and coverage, aware of the challenges, if journalists can work together, collaboration with the civil society, religious leaders, and other players are critical. Uh, the know-it-all attitude must just be stopped and we work with others and, and move away from the traditional thing of informing, educating, and entertaining uh, that has been there all over. That journalism has now moved to constructive journalism, to interpretative journalism. Let's help people understand more things. If we're talking about uh, the, the Niamey Convention on Tamlin, who knows about it? I mean, let's also just open up to read more, reference, talk more, so that then the, the more knowledge they become, we cannot become uh, the, the creator of knowledge if at all we are not knowledgeable ourselves. And when we're talking about content being the king, the content must be professional, informed, and, 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 and more extensive than the mere things that we do as, as pipelines. So there, there is more room for media, and media must continuously work with others, focus on public interest, and move out beyond just a reportorial and do interpretation for people to know what is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what a treat. Uh, thank you, our panelists, for that very engaging, uh, of course, cogent discussion we've had today. And all this is in a bigger, the bigger spectrum of uh, trying to steamroll, you know, presidential term limits and consolidating democracy here in Africa. And we begin, of course, from East Africa moving forward. I thank you also for our participants for the good questions that we've had and remarks and contributions also. Thank you for your valid company and being also amazingly patient. I think we've uh, spilled over the time we intended to actually end by one o'clock, but nonetheless, I really want to thank you so much. Uh, our panelist, Imam Idi Kasozi, Senior Lecturer, Islamic University in Uganda. Thank you for joining us today, Crispin Kaheru, uh, who is uh, the election and governor's experts, uh, former national coordinator of Citizen Coalition for Electoral Democracy in Uganda. Thank you for joining us today. Caroline Gaita, Executive Director, I'm Zalendo Trust here in Kenya. Thank you for joining us. Suba Churchill, presiding convener, Civil Society Reference Group. Thank you for joining us. And also Victor Buire, Head of Media Development and Strategy Media Council of Kenya. Thank you for joining us as well. And also just a tender reminder, Kituo Cha Katiba will host another webinar on Friday the 4th, this uh, uh, Friday the 4th. So this will still be on the same subject. So at least now we've laid the groundwork for you. You can also look forward on joining that particular conversation online on Friday as well. On behalf of Kituo Cha Katiba and uh, of course uh, uh, Katiba Institute here in Nairobi, I want to thank you so much for making sure that we have this conversation ongoing and availing this facility for people to actually have this discussion and also for National Democratic Institute who are actually sponsoring this particular conversation as well. Thank you so much for your valid company and I'll declare this meeting closed. <laughs>